this week's broadcast. Classic Movie Nights. The Cinemark Movie Theater in Hadley brings back the classics with their weekly showings of great movies from the past. Transperformance. A concert at Look Park joins local bands as they take to the stage to perform as their favorite bands named after food. This year's Transperformance theme. Restaurant Review. New Restaurant Hinge gives us a taste of their most popular dishes and a look inside Northampton's latest hotspot. In Focus, a series of in-depth interviews with local entrepreneurs and artists who try to offer a truly unique experience to our community. Comics, The Golden Years of Graham is a short comic about the life of inventor of the Graham Cracker and local resident of Northampton, Sylvester Graham. I'm Jill Pesheznik and this is Paradise City Press. We start this program with an interview with General Manager of the Cinemark Movie Theater, Dave Madunio, who describes the classic series events which brings back classic movies to the big screen. Through the summer and into the fall, moviegoers' favorite old films will be played, including Dr. Zhivago, Chinatown, E.T., and more. The aim of the showings is to get people back into the theater and excited about movies again, by reintroducing them to their favorite timeless movies, and to rediscover old gems for a new generation. My name is David Madunio. Um, I live in East Hampton and I've worked here at Cinemark for 12 years since we've opened. We started um, last year doing something called the Cult Classics and we showed more um, like culty sort of films and it went over really well. People really enjoyed it. So they tried to see if they could work with the studios to get some more of the classic films to draw a wider audience. Um, earlier this spring we did Godfather 1 and 2 and we did Ben-Hur in the big XD theater and it looked really nice and it was really fun. And it's working so well, we've now got six more films coming out. We're, we just did Jaws last Thursday, we're doing High Noon, Chinatown, Dr. Zhivago. So we're doing those and they sort of pick them on what's available and what they think people will like. And uh, it's been really fun, the, the turnout's been really good and people really like them because it's really fun to see something that you've never seen, especially if you're younger than that age group, you know, on the massive screen, you know, with new prints and new sound and all that and everything. Singing in the Rain um, was the 50th anniversary and that's through um, Fathom Events, which does like the, the operas and all that sort of stuff and organizes it. And they're working with Universal a lot, so we've got um, To Kill a Mockingbird coming up. Um, we're doing a double feature of Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, right around Halloween. We're doing The Birds, the Alfred Hitchcock film, and then they just announced that in early October we're also going to be doing um, E.T. for its 30th anniversary. People love Jaws. Um, they thought the print looked really good, it sounded great, um, and they were just really excited to see it on the big screen. And so last year for the cult classics it was really fun because those were more smaller films like um, Goonies and that sort of stuff, and people really loved it. So it's fun to see the classics now and get that. Um, maybe some of the crowd that wouldn't normally come on a regular basis to the movies to get them back into the theater to see movies that they grew up with. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. It's, um, you know, it's so big that it, it feels like you're, you know, back in one of those grand movie palaces from the, you know, the 50s and 60s and, you know, the great big sound and those plush seats. It, it takes going to a regular movie, you know, up to that next level when you're in there. So seeing something that's certified, you know, 100% basically on Rotten Tomatoes almost, one of these movies that's really good, it makes it really fun. Um, well, The Fathom are the To Kill a Mockingbird and some of those, so they're very similar. Um, they're just um, another another way that they want to get more people to come out to the theater and see these classic movies. I think a lot of those with the Fathom events, it's they show those before the movie's being released on Blu-ray, so they're trying to get people excited about the, the DVD coming out. Um, but the ones that we're doing with our classic series, which I know we'll probably do another set after this too, is just more about getting people excited about going to the movies. Trans Performance is a concert at Look Park which brings together the community and local musicians for an end of summer celebration with live performances and musical acts. The yearly event is held by the Northampton Arts Council and the Parent Teacher Organization. Funds raised through Trans Performance go to the benefit and support of art programs in local schools. This year, the theme of Trans Performance is food. Each musical act will perform as one of their favorite musician or bands named after food, such as Black Eyed Peas, Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Meatloaf. In its 22nd year, Trans Performance returns to Look Park, inviting once again local musical artists and bands. Each year, the concert maintains a theme for its acts. This year, the theme is food. Back in 1427, a small group of intrepid sailors and adventurers came to these shores. During difficult and thirty problems, the Luke family and the Florence clan worked to carve out a life in this magnificent park, so dear to so many. Now, after over 650 years, the Florence and Luke families have maintained this wonderful gathering spot. Though, may we have a few reprehensions concerning the content of some of the musical choices that have been played here. 
So it is another trans performance. Another lovely day. Groovy people. Groovy times. Hey, rock and roll. Thank you. Raising money for our programs in local schools, trans performance brings fun as well as support to the community. Local restaurants and businesses have to create this annual event. restaurant to hit Northampton's nightlife. Since April, Hinge has catered to bar hoppers, locals and visitors out on the town, and families. Three floors of food, music, and conversation, Hinge creates a warm, exciting atmosphere appealing for family meals or late nights out on the town. The first floor is the restaurant. Chef Sarah Klein and sous chef Dave Moses create one-of-a-kind specialty dishes as well as offering classic American bar foods with their own unique taste. Hinge caters to many different types of people. Tuesday night hosts poetry slams with local poets and visiting readers, performing for packed crowds, watching for the second and third floors. I've been working here since June, so Moses has been here from the get-go. He can tell you more about the startup of it. I talked to Brian, the owner, in April, actually in, in April. I stopped in just to check out the kitchen. I'm always really excited to have a new restaurant opening up in town, and I really respect what Brian had created in Karma. And He's incredible to work for, also. So there wasn't a position open that would fully utilize my skills at that point, but then in June something opened up, and so Brian and I got together, and here I am. Day one was a bit of a kerfuffle. It was, <laughs> uh, well, we drafted up a, a menu trying to be classy yet acceptable and accessible, but not too pedestrian. But like, so basically anyone from any walk of life could come in and find something on the menu they'd enjoy and still well executed. Some, some of the southern influence stuff is really popular. We're doing a black and catfish po' boy for our, our fall menu. Right now it's a full entree plate, but we're changing some of the menu items starting September 25th. So right now we're in process of developing that. We also want to bring in some influences for people who live here. So we're looking at doing a house-made pierogi plate with kielbasa and some braised red cabbage. And then also food that goes with beer, food you can pick up with your hands. Our grilled artichoke hearts are really, really popular, and because we do have 24 taps here, we're going to also be doing mussels steamed with beer, so that not only are people drinking the beer, but they're seeing that you can cook with it, and it's great. Even though the portions aren't the size as American eaters are used to, with the affordable price and the tastiness of each dish, Hinge delivers health-conscious and humane food in delicious little packages. Not all of it is local, because not everything is available locally. And it's also really important to us to have quality ingredients. So, for example, our ground beef is grass-fed and humanely raised. It's not from here because we don't want to charge $15 for a hamburger. We try and pay attention to what's reasonable. 
So we're able to source that consistently at an affordable price for us. But right now, lots of our vegetables are local. Uh, most cheeses are regional. So we certainly try and source as much as we possibly can from here. I mean, there's always the argument you make, like, what is local? Like, from the Pioneer Valley, from Massachusetts, from New England. And we don't go too much farther than that. Like, yeah, all of our cheeses right now are from Massachusetts. Uh, most of our vegetables come from, where is Red Fire? Red, Red Fire, Granby, and Montague. Granby, and the, yeah. and the Tuesday Farmer's Market yes. is where most of them are from right now, also. I've lived all over the place. I went to Hampshire College years ago, and then I lived every place from New York City, Seattle, Tucson. I taught at a cooking school in Vermont for a couple of years, and then I was looking to move away from Vermont and found some opportunities here, so I came back because there's so much that goes on in this area. Music, art, food, just all the farmer's markets are incredible also, and we really try and use the local stuff when we can. I've been living in the area for about six years, uh, bouncing from restaurant to restaurant, trying to find one that fit really well, and this is it was really the first one that I found that, that kind of embraced me and my style. And it's, it's really, really nice. It's a really accepting place that we've got here. I've heard to say, I think the Dirty Truth has a few more taps than we do. I think they have 35, and we have 30? We have uh, 24 on this floor, and then I think another six upstairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 30 total. Yep. And, and have, it's uh, constantly rotating. Except for one. We have one valley-based, uh, it's not a beer, it's, it's a libation. It's called Ginger Libation. It's made in Greenfield, right? Yeah. Uh, it's the only one that never moves. Everything else, I mean, a lot of these micro brews from around the country, there it's really hard to get. Uh, they're in such high demand, so we have to rotate through the beers. But we'll usually have an IPA, a Pilsner, uh, usually a Belgian, and then some kind of darker beer. But well, we try to stack it as much as we can. But on the on the busy weekends, we'll just fly through kegs. I mean, I just checked in twelve kegs today. And it's, yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> for the three floors that we have, this main floor is the restaurant, so when people are here for dinner, we, we open at 4 every day, and we're serving a full dinner menu from 4 until 10. So this is the main dining floor. We do have seating upstairs from 4 until about 8-ish, depending on what the event is upstairs. So when we're busy, people sit upstairs to eat as well. The third floor has a pool table, and that's where people have more of a lounge. There's some red leather couches up there, and that's where people hang out. And then the second level becomes the dance floor and that's where the stage is and there's a smaller bar up there also where people can hang out. Right now it's, it's everybody and we're really excited to see what happens when students come back to town also. So we've got a range of families coming in with their kids to people coming in for late night hip hop rap events. It's really interesting our clientele is usually depicted by the night of the week because we have what well, we have poetry on Tuesdays so we get a really young crowd mixed with a bunch of older locals but then like Friday and Saturday when we have our DJs and our local bands it's usually early 20-somethings and students in full force and yeah this bar will be three four deep for hours. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a sight. I think the space is really welcoming also this is where I would want to come and hang out and sit at the bar and have dinner. And on my nights off, that's a lot of the time where you'll find me. After our interview, Klein and Moses made us some of their most popular dishes to try for ourselves, and the results did not displease. The meatloaf panini is served with the homemade ketchup is a dish unique to Hinge. The meatloaf is tender and mouth-watering, but in between the crunchiness of the panini bread, it's a mouthful of flavor with the ketchup as a dipping sauce. It was good because the salty and meatiness of the sandwich is pleasantly cut with the mild and sweet side. Veggie Burger is the old restaurant Karma's own recipe, and it's satisfying for vegetarian and meat lovers alike. Even though I'm not keen on vegetarian food, the Veggie Burger was one of my favorite things at Hinge. The burger has the texture of couscous and the flavor of Thanksgiving stuffing. The pulled pork sandwich of the Carolina mustard was really good also. There's a lot of meat in it, which I liked, and it was salty but not over salted. It helped enhance the flavor of the barbecue taste. The mustard was an unusual addition to one of my favorite classic sandwiches, but the muskiness of the mustard went really well with the sweet but salty taste of the sandwich. Appetizers such as the grilled artichoke carts with beer fondue and the fresh cut french fries with homemade ketchup give customers a delicious and fulfilling start to their night. The crispness and buttery flavor of the artichoke carts with the mild but cheesy fondue are sufficient enough for a late night snack or to generate an appetite for more. The homemade ketchup gives the customer the idea of what real ketchup is meant to taste like. I liked it because you could taste the texture of the fresh tomatoes in the ketchup. It was a little spicy, but a little sweet at the same time. 
For dessert, the flourless chocolate stout cake with caramel is fluffy and light and almost tastes like whipped fudge. I'm a huge chocolate lover, so the more chocolate the better. But for people who just get a sweet tooth sometimes, this is fulfilling but petite enough to soothe anybody's craving. Next, we have the third installment of our In Focus series, which highlights individuals in our town. Northampton is rich with entrepreneurs who work behind the scenes to bring entertainment and the arts to our community. In Focus is an opportunity to briefly get to know your neighbors and the work that they do. New Tattoo Parlor in Northampton, Bang Bang Body Arts is featured. We take a look at tattoo artist and Bang Bang employee Liz Peterson as she describes her craft, what the job of a tattoo artist takes, and about the art she has on her own body. I mean, you still get judged having a lot of tattoos, but I'm prepared to deal with that. At the same time, you get a lot of people that are fascinated by it, too. You may be working for somebody, but you're usually your own boss still anyways. I kind of like that, you know? You get a lot of freedom that way. And if there's tattoos you don't want to do, uh, I've turned down plenty of swastikas. Mm -hmm. It's not about the money, you know? I'd rather not get paid all day. I have a lot of butt tattoos. They're usually pretty strange. There never be any normal butt tattoos. <laughs> yeah. Totally, because I've got some silly stuff too. That's fine. Usually, if you're working with other tattoo artists, and you just get like, an idea for a tattoo, and you just want it right then and there. Like, and if, you know, you have some free time. It's like, all right, put a tooth on me. <laughs> I feel like Christmas, I always draw my grandmother something. Of all the people in my family, I think she was the most supportive of me tattooing, which I never saw coming. It's uh, my mom tattoo. She says I love mom and Ty. She oh, did not cool. appreciate my mom tattoo. <laughs> she saw it, she was like, you could just tell me. Maybe like nine times out of ten, people usually like my work, and I think that's a really big compliment. I didn't realize how strong I would get. From it. You know what I mean? I guess you hold that machine for eight years and my right arm is definitely pretty strong now. I think it would go insane if I worked in the office. The life of Sylvester Graham, inventor of the Graham Cracker and local resident of Northampton, is transformed into a black and white comic. Graham had never intended his cracker to be used the way it is famous today as a s'more, but designed it as a part of his beliefs in the way he thought life should be lived. Eccentric but old-fashioned, right. Sylvester Graham is a character for the ages and for the comics, but we'll thank him eternally for his contribution to the world's most delicious cookie sandwich. The future inventor of Graham crackers, Sylvester Graham started out as the youngest of seven, the son of a minister. Unfortunately, Graham's father died when he was very young, Unable to care for him, his mother sent him to live with relatives. Later, Graham went on to Amherst Academy, where he developed ideas about health, diet, and exercise. After only one year at the academy, Graham became sick and had to drop out. After a long recovery, Graham got married and moved to New Jersey, where he began lecturing and eventually came to Northampton. He had some controversial ideas about vegetarianism, temperance, and chastity. He also spoke about courtship. Once he lectured a crowd of women on the subject, he made many enemies that day. Graham also made bakers and butchers angry because he encouraged his audiences to avoid eating meat and to make their own bread. Sylvester Graham was very unpopular in some regions. He was even kicked out of Amory Hall for the protection of other residents. Still, some of his opinions on courtship were appreciated in England and Germany. Some of his lectures on temperance and eating meat featured odd biblical references. Later in life, his senses faded along with his youth, and he had been spotted swimming in the Mill River, walking around in his bedclothes, and being pushed around Northampton in a wheelbarrow. Graham's deteriorating health led to an early death at the age of 57, leaving behind his children and wife. Sylvester Graham attempted to make a difference in the way people ate, drank, and lived. Ultimately, Graham crackers were his greatest contribution to society, giving birth to Golden Grahams and S'mores. That's our broadcast for this week. Thank you for being with us. I'm Jill Pichesnik reporting from NCTV Studios on Elm Street, Northampton, Massachusetts. Have a good week.